A hot summer day in Gaffney, South Carolina in 2009 started like any other typical day. Vehicles bustled up the I-85 corridor in both directions while people jetted off to work. Gaffney is in the upstate of South Carolina near the North Carolina border. The area is known for three things. One, having a water tower shaped like a peach. Two, being home to fictional character Frank Underwood, played by Kevin Spacey from House of Cards. And three, being home to the infamous serial killer, the Gaffney Strangler. On June 27, 2009, the community became tied with their second. We are the Lantern Keepers. And I'm your host, John G. Clark. This is Patrick Tracy Burris. Come take a walk with me through the dark side of South Carolina while we explore legends, folklore, and true crime. Welcome to the Lantern Podcast. Events that were about to unfold in the South Carolina upstate would soon put the community on high alert and left many searching for answers. The horrific five-day killing spree resembled heinous acts committed 40 years before when the Gaffney Strangler released his reign of terror, murdering four people, two women and two girls, between 1967 and 1968. Leroy Martin met his demise in 1972 when he was murdered while incarcerated at Central Correctional Institution in Columbia. Martin decided to allow the long arm of the judicial system to decide his fate. The new face of fright would have other plans. Many cases are clearly open and closed like a good book, while others beg the age-old question of who done it. Some have speculated, such as Burris's family, that he wasn't a responsible party of the shootings. Per comments made in a publication from the same year, 2009, that he just fit the script and shouldered the blame for being an ex-felon that recently served time in the big house with a rap sheet of almost 25 pages long. His crimes ranged from theft to drugs. They claimed Burris was a violent person and even presented some facts to the case. Unfortunately, we would never know because Burris isn't talking. Was Burris wrongly identified in the case? Or was he a cold-blooded killer that lashed out while being fueled by narcotics? On June 27, 2009, Klein Cash was gunned down in the living room inside his home. He would become the first of five Cherokee County residents murdered in less than a week by a serial killer. Mr. Cash was a local farmer in the area. According to the Greenville Journal, the man police say killed Cash and others came to the peach grower's home to inquire about purchasing hay. Gray said Vicki Cash, Klein's wife, told her the two men were having soft drinks at the kitchen table when she left to run some errands. Gray said the family has learned her brother didn't have any hay to sell, but called her friend to see if he could help the man. Klein died like he lived, trying to help somebody, Gray said. The killer struck again on July 1st, 2009, when 83-year-old Hazel Linder and her daughter, 50-year-old Gina Linder Parker, were found a little after 3 p.m., bound and shot to death in the mother's home. Hazel Linder and her daughter, Gina Parker, both were public school teachers who had been Teachers of the Year in their districts. Linder taught school for more than four decades. July 2nd, 2009. Stephen Tyler and his daughter, 15-year-old Abby Tyler, were the next victims of this psychopath's murderous rampage. While her father was pronounced dead at the scene, the younger Tyler was airlifted and later died in the hospital. Mr. Tyler was a deacon, treasurer, and Sunday school teacher at the Cherokee Avenue Baptist Church. He was the co-owner-operator of Tyler Home Center in Gaffney. All the victims had one thing in common, a deep religious faith. 
All were active members of their churches. Why were these five chosen? We will never know. The trail of terror led back to one person, Patrick Tracy Burris, and a manhunt pursued to find him. The article from the Greenville Journal written on June 16, 2009, we will read in its entirety. On July 16, 2009, police were called to a burglary in progress in Dallas, North Carolina, a small town in the northern portion of Gaston County. Eyewitnesses reported seeing a vehicle that matched the description of the murder suspect's Ford Explorer outside an apparently abandoned house. Upon arrival, police spoke with Burris, who gave a false name. Officer Catherine Williamson was able to ascertain the true identity of the sub subject and discovered he was wanted for a probation violation. The three officers, Williamson, Jim Shaw, and Graham Kuzia, entered the house. During the arrest, Officer Kuzia tased Burris, and he pulled out a small handgun and fired, shooting Shaw in the upper thigh. The officers returned fire and fatally wounded Burris. Ballistic tests, as well as checks on the suspect's vehicle, later proved the dead gunman to be Burris. Burris's death left a lot of questions and not enough answers. Did Patrick Tracy Burris act alone? Was he the gunman, or was he the point of focus due to his long rap sheet and the fact he happened to fit the script? An article from the Greenville Journal on July 16, 2009 with a Burr's family only added to the mystery more. His family called him Tracy. They said he once entered a tough man contest and fled the ring after his opponent landed the first blow, and that he suffered third-degree burns on his hands, making sure everyone had escaped a fire he caused with a phone charger. Patrick Tracy Burr's had problems, but his family is finding it hard to believe, harder still to live with, the idea he killed five people in Gaffney in a five-day period. In an exclusive interview on the porch of his aunt and uncle's home in Reedsville, North Carolina, and in a phone interview from Florida with his mother and brother, the Burr's family spoke of the man they knew and how they learned of his final days. Burr's was killed in a shootout with Gaston County, North Carolina police responding to a burglary call. To be sure, the Burr's feel sympathy for the families of the victims. Klein Cash, a prominent peach farmer, Hazel Linder and Gina Parker, mother and daughter who were beloved teachers, and Stephen and Abby Tyler, father and daughter, closing up their downtown appliance store. But they wonder about the sketch police made and the description of the killer. The sketch shows a man with a pear-shaped face. Burgess was oblong. Witnesses described the killer as six foot two inches. Burgess was easily six foot nine inches and weighed nearly three hundred pounds. He could not go through a door without bending over, said Waynette, Burris's sister. The evidence does not convince me Tracy did this, said his aunt, Donna Scott, 53 at the time. We know we can never clear Tracy's name, but we want to see him cleared as a serial killer. We can't believe that. Murder was out of character for him, said his brother Randy Burris from his home in Florida. He was involved, yes, from his past history, he might have been taking out the gun to give it to them. Scott said her nephew did not have a dysfunctional childhood. His parents were loving and nurturing, family members said. He started using drugs when he was 13. He got involved with the wrong crowd, Waynette said. He started to steal to get his drugs. He was partly homeschooled, but never completed high school. He got his GED while he was incarcerated in North Carolina. Wendy Willard, a first cousin, spent summers with Burris' family after they moved away from North Carolina. She remembers the tough man contest Burris entered. That man hit him on the shoulder one time and he yelled, That hurt, she recalled. Tracy left the ring and didn't go back. She also remembers the apartment fire in Eden, North Carolina. He sustained third-degree burns on his hands and feet trying to get everybody out of the building, Willer said. If he was violent, he would have only been concerned about himself, not anybody else. They acknowledge he had a troubled past. They know of his criminal history, armed robbery, common law robbery, traffic violations, weapon violations, forgeries, breaking and entering, and possession of stolen goods, blackmail. 
They know he most recently served seven and a half years in a North Carolina prison and was released on April 29th. Randy Burr spoke to him in May, a few days after he was released. He had all the money from work release, Randy Burr said. He told me he bought a truck and was looking for a house. The next thing they knew, a police officer from their town in Florida was at their front door. You need to call the Gaston County Police in North Carolina, he told Faye Burris. Patrick Tracy Burris' mother. They have a message about your son. Miss Burris made the call. They said he was killed in a shootout, Miss Burris, 60 at the time, said. After that, I dropped the phone. No matter what happens, when you lose a loved one, it hurts. Randy Burris, 44 at the time, continued the phone conversation. The police did not tell him his brother, his brother younger by two years, had been a suspect in the murders of five people in Cherokee County barely a week earlier. We found out about that on the internet, Randy Burris said. In Reedsville, Barry Burris, an uncle, and his family were watching the live telecast of a news conference from Gaffney as Sheriff Bill Blanton announced the town's reign of terror was over. The man shot by police in North Carolina, he said, was a serial killer that had frightened county residents. No one at Burris' family had an idea the man Blanton was talking about was one of their own until the sheriff held up a photo of the killer. Burris said the sheriff didn't have to say the name. I started getting on the phone to ask my family if they had seen it, Barry Burr, 64 at the time, said. It was devastating, Burris' sister, Waynette, said. During a phone call, Waynette lashed out at a detective who was working the case. A bit later, she called back to the sheriff's office to apologize. I told him my brother wouldn't shoot somebody, Waynette said. With all his faults, his heart was good. Waynette, 43, broke ties with her brother a number of years ago because of the stealing and the drugs. First was in an abandoned home in Gaston County with Sharon and Mark Stamey, siblings whose mother owned a dilapidated structure. They told police they had been partying with Burris for days and didn't know what Burris had been up to. They did say he showed a special interest in television coverage of some killings in South Carolina. Sharon Stamey and Burris were both scheduled for court appearances the morning after the shootout with officers. Stamey was going in on drug charges, and Burris had a traffic violation. Officers said they used a taser on Burris and returned fire after Burris had shot one of the responding officers in the leg. Waynette said Burris' body will, will be cremated because her mother's family does not have the money to bring the body back to Florida for burial. I like to keep half of him up here like I did for my daddy, Waynette said. I scattered him out there on my grandparents' graves. I would like to do the same thing for Tracy. Burris was also under investigation by the Mooresville, North Carolina Police Department. Matthew Ryan Stewart, 31, was shot and killed in his bed just after midnight. Back in 2009, his wife Angela Stewart was shot and wounded in the arm. Their children were at home. Their children were at home, but weren't hurt. Like the Cherokee killings, the Mooresville murder involved a man bursting into a home in an apparent home invasion style. It happened just 45 minutes from where Burris was reportedly living. Some have speculated that Burris killed for drug money because he spent his last three days taking drugs according to a brother and sister from Gaston County, with whom he spent much of his final days. But investigators aren't certain he killed for money. They said he left cash and other valuables at all of the crime scenes. Robbins said he doesn't believe anything was taken from the Stewart's home. The Stewart case remains unsolved to this day. Patrick Tracy Burst will forever go down in South Carolina history books, beside other infamous serial killers like Leroy Martin, Pee Wee Gaskins, Ty Colehelp, among others, for his trail of terror that shook the quiet town of Gaffney, South Carolina. Ironically enough, after Burris was gunned down in North Carolina, the killing stopped. Only one person knows exactly what took place during the summer of 2009, and he isn't Lazarus. Join us next time as we explore the dark side of South Carolina's most infamous.